Um, I'm just going to give you a very quick run through in terms of who we are and what we're up to. Uh, so this deck is not particularly detailed um, and uh, there's, it's really just a, a, a pretty brief summary. So not too much detail. Um, we're a public company, so that's our safe harbor statement. If you care to read that, too late. Uh, right, so um, we're a pure play cell therapy business. Um, and our programs are really based around two very distinct cell therapy assets. Uh, these are both progenitor cell lines. CTX is our primary asset. It's a neural progenitor cell line. And we also have a, uh, a human retinal progenitor cell line as well. CTX is immortalized, and uh, the HRPCs are expanded in low oxygen culture. CTX is directed towards our vascular programs, most notably stroke or chronic stroke disability, to be more precise. And it is also more recently a producer cell line for an emerging exosome platform that we're developing as well, uh, which we're particularly excited by. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to focus today, though, on the pure cell therapy uh, programs. Um, the HRPC cells, uh, unsurprisingly, are targeted towards retinal degenerative diseases. Uh, this is the pipeline. Um, so as you can see, CTX for stroke disability is our most advanced program coming out of phase two and uh, all being well going into phase three very shortly. Uh, we also have a nascent program in CLI that's uh, already been through a phase one trial. We're currently not investing further in that program right now. Uh, and we've redeployed resources really more towards uh, the other programs you see here. Um, the exosome program is at its early uh, preclinical stage at this point, targeting solid tumors. And on the HRPC side, uh, the two targets here are retinitis pigmentosa uh, and cone rod dystrophy, uh, the former being currently in a phase one, two clinical trial uh, here in the US. As a public company, we're, we benefit from pretty substantial institutional shareholder involvement uh, or investment rather. Uh, uh, the key investors here are listed. Uh, these are prominent uh, generalist and specialist uh, life science investors uh, in the UK. Um, in terms of finances, we're reasonably well funded at the moment, 70 million on the balance sheet at the last reporting date, 31 March. Uh, and that will give us a, a runway to fund our programs into mid and late stage clinical development. So going uh, uh, a little bit more detail into CTX, what is CTX? Um, it is a, a neural progenitor cell line, as I said. Um, it's an allogeneic cell therapy treatment, um, and one that we've been able to um, uh, 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 really manufacture under GMP, cryopreserve, and try and convert into something as close to a standard biopharmaceutical as we can in the interest of having it capable of being commercialized at a reasonable cost of goods in due course. Um, and we've made quite a, quite a few positive steps in that direction. Um, importantly, we don't have to immunosuppress patients as well um, uh, in the studies that we're doing. And that's also the case actually with the HRPCs uh, in the, uh, the retinitis pigmentosa study where uh, we're running. So just moving on to stroke more specifically, and importantly, we are targeting um, the consequences of stroke. So downstream permanent disability that results from uh, uh, stroke if you survive the initial insult. Um, uh, you saw some of this data earlier, actually, with the Athesis presentation, if you were there for that one. So, so in the interest of time, I won't, I won't repeat it. Suffice to say, it's a very clear unmet medical need. Um, and this slide here really, I suppose, makes the distinction perhaps between what athesis are doing in the acute phase with a cell-mediated approach and what we're attempting to do downstream if those patients survive the stroke but suffer a residual deficit. So our view, and it's been our view for many years, is that there is a place for a cell-mediated approach in both of these settings, both in the acute and the chronic phase. And of course, we very much hope that um, the players involved in both of those settings are successful uh, uh, in showing the benefits of a cell therapy approach in this, uh, in this difficult condition. And again, you would have seen this theme as well coming through in some of the other presentations. Uh, CTX, we know preclinically through published work, exerts its effects through a number of mechanisms, uh, primarily angiogenesis, neurogenesis, and synaptogenesis in the case of um, CTX injected uh, into the brain. Um, so moving on to the clinical development in stroke, uh, we've finished a phase one study that was published in the Lancet last year. This was a single site dose escalating safety study in 11 patients, 11 disabled stroke patients, 
um, measuring primary safety, of course, um, and uh, to that end, we saw no cell or immune-related adverse events of any concern, and we did see uh, putative evidence of improvement against the baseline level of disability in these patients. And in both our phase one and our phase two studies, which were both single arm studies, uh, we did monitor those patients for a stable deficit for several weeks prior to implantation of the CTX cells. So having completed the phase one, we moved on to phase two, uh, which was a larger study, again, conducted in the UK, uh, in this case in around uh, eight sites uh, dotted up and down the UK. Um, again, in stable disabled uh, stroke patients, this time, again, garnering further longer-term safety data and also uh, 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 looking for further evidence of um, uh, beneficial outcomes in these patients post-transplantation. In this particular case, the patients were treated between uh, 2 and 12 months uh, post-infarct at the highest dose that we used in, in phase 1, which is a, a payload of 20 million CTX cells directly implanted through a neurosurgical procedure, which typically takes around 90 minutes. Uh, and the patient will typically stay in overnight or maybe two nights uh, 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 and then go home. And that's been the case for all the patients we've treated so far. Uh, the outcome measures were all the standard measures you'd expect in a study of disability uh, of this nature, uh, including modified Rankin, Bartel, Fugelmeyer, and so on. Um, what did we see? Well, we were greatly encouraged, actually, by uh, uh, the scores we saw on some of these measures. Modified Rankin is a particularly important one for us. It's very likely to be the primary endpoint in our phase three study. Uh, it is a measure of dependence. It's a six-point scale. Uh, the lower the scale, the, uh, the less disabled you are. And uh, in the phase two study, Pisces two, we saw uh, about a 33% response rate on this measure. Uh, which is uh, a response rate of interest and certainly one that merits further investigation in a, in a larger placebo-controlled study. And that's partly explained by the following slide. Um, if you can read this, this is based on a registry done in Sweden and published this year in over 40,000 disabled stroke patients in the community. And it gives you some indication as to the, um, the power of this is power of modified ranking as a measure of dependence and pharmacoeconomically what that means if you can drop a patient down a notch on that scale, most particularly um, circled in red here between MRS 4 to 3 or 3 to 2. That's where the greatest pharmacoeconomic benefit uh, uh, can be derived through savings in health and social care costs in caring for these patients on an annualized basis. So unsurprisingly, as we move forward into late stage clinical development with CTX in stroke, it's, 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 it's modified rank in three, 4 to 3 and 3 to 2 that we'll be targeting uh, in that late stage study. Uh, again, Bartel, which was also uh, uh, mentioned in the, uh, in the previous presentation from Athesis, this time a measure of activities of daily living. And again, here in the evaluable patients in this study, which were 15 out of the 21, uh, we saw positive responses uh, or significant responses uh, from eight of those patients. So again, something that's very indicative uh, of beneficial effect, albeit in a single arm study, and, and, and moves us uh, certainly forward into planning for a, uh, a, a phase three study. Um, so uh, basically, we, we, we're doing just that now. We're planning for a phase three study to be run here in the US and uh, in European sites. Uh, we're in advanced discussions with FDA and EMA uh, in Europe to that end, and we're hoping to file and commence this study uh, in the early part of 2018. Just moving on then to the other, uh, the other asset, the HRPC cells targeting retinal degeneration. Um, and really this is based around the ability of HRPCs post-transplantation to both preserve vision through maintenance of photoreceptors and also to differentiate and engraft, all being well to engender a degree of uh, uh, sight improvement uh, in these patients. Um, we've been working collaboratively uh, here in the US for many years uh, with the Scapin's Eye Research Institute, part of Harvard, which is where we originally licensed the technology, and uh, more recently at a clinical level at Mass Eye and Ear over in Boston as well. Um, we recently gained approval from FDA to use a frozen formulation um, for our clinical work uh, and beyond having originally started that phase one, two study with a fresh formulation. So again, that very much eases the logistics around um, shipping and storing uh, a, a cell therapy such as this. Uh, and it's of course follows what we did with CTX, uh, which is itself a cryopreserved uh, formulation with a six month shelf life in that case. 
We're targeting RP and cone rod dystrophy, and this slide just really gives a summary of what both of those uh, rare indications uh, are. Uh, in the case of RP, uh, it's manifest initially by a loss of peripheral vision, as you see in the image. Uh, cone rod dystrophy is kind of the opposite. It's a loss of cones in the central retina. Ultimately, the, the outcome in both cases is blindness. Uh, RP is a larger indication across all its various mutations than uh, CRD, as you can see from the numbers here. RP is our, uh, our more advanced uh, uh, program. Uh, it's already in a phase one, two study, as I mentioned. Uh, we have orphan drug designation both in Europe and the US for this, uh, for this program and fast track designation as well. Uh, what we're hoping to do with cone rod dystrophy, given the very similar nature from a, a, a patient perspective in these uh, two indications, is to garner uh, sufficient phase one data, safety data in the RP program to allow us to move swiftly into a phase two study in cone rod dystrophy patients during the course of next year as that phase one data matures from the RP, the ongoing RP study. So finally, just to wrap up, um, I've actually made much better time than I usually do as well. Um, just some near-term clinical milestones to watch out for uh, from Renuron over the next few months or so. Uh, so in terms of CTX for stroke disability, uh, we're hoping to announce longer term follow up data from that Pisces 2 phase 2 study uh, during the course of uh, what remains of this year, uh, and then moving that uh, program into its phase 3 phase uh, during the course of uh, H1 2018. On uh, retinitis pigmentosa, uh, we're currently in the middle of running the phase 1 2 study. We finished the phase 1 element, we're now dosing phase 2 patients in that uh, study. Uh, uh, so we're looking to garner some initial data this year and then longer term data, both safety and efficacy during the course of next year. And as I just mentioned, all being well, uh, uh, moving uh, into a second phase two study in cone rod dystrophy patients. Uh, the exosome program is rather more speculative. If things go to plan and there's a lot of work up being done at the moment, then the initial target for, uh, for those uh, exosomes which are derived from our CTX cells will actually be a solid tumor indication. Uh, yet to be uh, decided, and uh, speculatively we'd be looking to file an IND perhaps at the back end of next year or sometime in early 2019. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention.